to declare, I say at this time, his righteousness, that he might be just and the justifier of him which believeth in Jesus. Verse 25 discussed the declaration of Christ's righteousness for the Old Testament saints. Verse 26 discusses the declaration of Christ's righteousness for New Testament saints. It's one of the greatest statements of the scriptures. It tells you that the Lord had a problem. His problem was how to declare people righteous when they weren't. Did you know that the Lord won't do anything wrong in order to save you from hell? Shall not the judge of all the earth to do right? Yes, he will. There are a bunch of people today who believe in doing anything to win souls to Christ. And I mean anything. That isn't right. God himself won't do it. It's never right to do wrong in order to get the chance to do right. Before God would do anything wrong to keep you out of hell, he would let you go to hell. He's not going to sin no matter how much he loves you. So how did God solve this problem? How could he justify a bunch of sinners, declaring them to be righteous and yet still be right himself when he did, when he did it? How could he reconcile his holiness and wrath with his grace and mercy? He came down and took man's place. He lived a righteous life required of a man and took the sins and the punishment that was due to a man for his sins. Then he offered a swap, your sins, hell and self-righteousness for his perfect righteous and Ephesios sacrifice. Salvation has nothing to do with keeping the sacraments or the church of the golden rule or anything like that. If you are some poor old sinner reading this and you are caught up in trying to do this and do that, you will go to hell as fast as a bullet. Do you want to go to heaven? Then I will tell you the only thing you need to know. It's real easy. All you have to do is live a, sin a sinless life. That is all God requires of you. That shouldn't be too hard, should it? Should it? Just live a perfect life and never make one mistake. That's all there is to, to it. If you want to go to heaven, just live sinless. Well, you say, I can't do that. Then you are in a mess, aren't you? God doesn't require an almost perfect life. He doesn't tolerate a little sin. He doesn't allow you to ignore your past sins and live a perfect life from now on. He requires an absolutely sinless life, perfect from start to finish. Now, God knew you couldn't give him that, so he lived that life for you. The deal is you accept the life he lived on your behalf, a life he will accept and you can get it get into heaven. The same thing works on the devil. He knows what God requires. And he knows what you are really like. He will come to you and accuse you. Where is your perfect life? When he does that, just show him the life in which you are trusting. Show him Christ's life. And he can stop you or deny you your place in glory. For God's sake, don't talk to him about your church attendance, your tithing record, or your Christian service or how good you are. That will simply give him an open door to beat you to death with your own sins and failings. You can always do better, and he knows it. That's the imputed righteousness of God, and there isn't a Campbellite or Catholic who knows anything about what I just said. If a man is counting on his own works to get him to heaven, then he is not trusting Christ's righteousness. That person believes in a partial, partial atonement and he is counting on his own self-righteousness to make up for the part that God hasn't done. That is not New Testament salvation. Where is boasting then? It's excluded. By what law? Of works? Nay, but by the law of faith. Therefore we conclude that, that a man is justified by faith without the deeds of the law. In light of 
what we just learned in verses 21 to 27. What room does anyone have to boast in his own good works? There is no room for boasting in, in your own self-righteousness. You are not going to get up to heaven and tell anyone, well, I repented, believed, confessed, and was baptized. I endured to the end. I took the sacraments. I took care of my family. I paid my bills. I paid my taxes. I faithfully attended church. I gave tithes and offerings. I helped my fellow man. And as a result, look, here, here I am. If you make it to heaven like that, you will be out of place. The people in heaven aren't bragging about how good they were on earth. They were singing, Thou, Jesus, art worthy, for thou wast slain and hast redeemed us to God by, the, by thy blood. Revelation chapter 5, verse 9. They are shouting, Worthy is the Lamb that was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing. Revelation chapter 5, verse 12. Do you, do you think that in the middle of all that anybody is going to listen to you, brag about yourself? If you want to brag about yourself and realize, of course, that when you do, you will be a fool, then go into a country like Egypt or Saudi Arabia or Indonesia or some other place and find a busy street corner and stand there with your Bible in hand and preach at the top of your lungs, Jesus Christ is God Almighty in the flesh. He died, at, he died on the cross for your sins, and he rose again from the dead. One of these days you are going to stand before him, and he will judge you. Receive him, or go to hell, turn or burn, rip, repent or perish. Muhammad was nothing but a demon-possessed false prophet. Then after you have recovered from the horrific possible beating, stoning or mutilations you receive, you, receive, you might have some scars to brag about. Do that repeatedly over a period of, say, 20 to 30 years all over the world, and perhaps you will finally get someone to listen to you when you brag. But when it comes to salvation, all bragging is out. The law of faith excludes it. How can you brag about what you have done when you are depending completely on Christ for salvation? Brag about him. Verse 28 is the conclusion of all Paul's arguments in the chapter. You are a sinner, whether you are Jew or Gentile. You need Christ's righteousness to do for you what you cannot do for yourself. Conclusion. A man is justified by faith without the deeds of the law. Turn to Acts chapter 13 verses 38 to 39. Through this man Jesus is preached unto you the forgiveness of sins. And by him all that believe are justified from all things from which ye couldn't be justified by the law of Moses. Notice Campbell lights that it doesn't say, All them that, the, that believe and are baptized are justified. Notice charismatics, it doesn't say, Justified from all things except the unpardonable sin. Notice Catholics, that doesn't say, By him and Mary or, or the Pope, or the priest, or the saint, etc. With the Catholic, there are all kinds of people and things that could be inserted here. All are justified. Folks do have a time of it. Justification is by him. It's to all that believe, and they are justified from all things. Note also that it's not merely the works of the law that are of no effect. It's any kind of works, Romans chapter 4, verse 5. But to him that worketh not, but believeth, on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. So if you are counting on any kind of good work that you have done to get you to heaven, then Christ's righteousness is not counted to you. The only man to receive Christ's righteousness is the man who is, work, who is working not, so called. In other words, he is not depending on any good work he does to gain him favor before God. Notice that Ephesians chapter 2 verse 10, For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, comes after Ephesians chapter 2 verses 8 to 9. 
For by grace are ye saved through faith, not of works, lest any man should boast. Now, if you are hell-bent on getting to heaven by your own self-righteousness, you will always leave clear scriptures, written to Gentiles by the apostle to the Gentiles, in favor of an epistle written to the twelve tribes of Israel, before the clear revelation to Paul was given. A self-righteous soul, in an attempt to damn himself with scripture, will always choose James chapter 2 over Romans chapter 3 every time, because it isn't written to him. You have to watch your own spirit when you go to the book, or the Lord will let you find what you want to find, and he will use it to destroy you. Ezekiel chapter 14 verses 1 to 11. Is he the God of the Jews only? Is he not also of the Gentiles? Yes, of the Gentiles also, seeing it's one God which shall justify the circumcision by faith and, are un and uncircumcision through faith. Do we then make void the law through faith? God forbid, yea, we establish the law. Some expositors have made much of God justifying the Jew by faith and the Gentile through faith. But there is not much you can do with it. The same apostle who wrote Ephesians chapter 2 verse 8, by grace through faith, to Gentile Christians in Ephesus, Ephesus wrote Romans chapter 5 verse 1 to Gentile Christians in Rome. Therefore being justified, justified by faith, the words through and by simply point to the medium which is being used to justify the sinner. In this case, the medium is faith. Of course, the object of that faith, if you are to reach heaven, has to be the Lord Jesus Christ and his blood atonement. Now verse 29. Just because you are trusting Christ doesn't mean you, you have voided the law. The law is still God's words. It's still the truth. It's still living and powerful. Remember, you are placing your faith in a man who has kept the law for you. Inasmuch then as Christ kept the law on our behalf, and because of that we can re receive his righteousness, we are confirming that the law is right or else Christ would, wouldn't have needed to keep it. Also as believers who are in Christ, we live out the life of Christ in us. So quite naturally, the new man will strive to be like Christ and keep those parts of the commandments that are applicable to him. We will strive to put God first in our lives. We will place our trust in him and not things. We will make an effort to keep a civil tongue in our heads. Though we are not under the Sabbath as Christians, we do set apart a special day to honor the resurrection of Christ. We will obey and honor our parents, as Paul re reaffirmed in Ephesians chapter 6, verses 1 to 3. We put the carp on our hatred and lust that was not there before salvation. The difference, though, between us and the unsaved is that we are not keeping these commandments in an effort to justify ourselves or even to try to stay saved. We are doing these things out of, a, out of a heart of love for the one who saved us by his blood. We know that lying and cheating and coveting break our fellowship with him. So a Christian tries to live right, to stay in fellowship with the Lord. John chapter 14 verse 15, Romans chapter 13 verse 10, Ephesians chapter 2 verse 10 and chapter 4 verses 14 to 32, and 1 John chapter 1 verse 7. Amen.